Hello and welcome to A Time to Reconcile. I'm Pastor Tom Pickett. Thank you for joining us tonight. My wife and I are recording this sermon video in our living room and we want to share that with you. The title of tonight's message is, Jesus says, do not judge others. And we know what a temptation that is to judge others. So we want to talk about that this evening. But why is Jesus the only one who can judge people after his returning glory? Jesus is the only one who fully understands and expresses the love of our Father. And so we need this kind of look at us so that we can receive the judgment that God wants us to receive. That's not a negative comment, that's a positive comment because God is God who's merciful, He's tender-hearted in Jesus. But we as the children of our Father are still growing in Jesus' grace and knowledge. So we certainly can't be the judge over all people. Well, let's look at some of Jesus' comments in His Sermon on the Mount. And before we get started, let's pray about this. Please join with me. Uh, Father, we thank You for guiding and leading and directing us. Jesus, thank You for Your inspiration. It's all about doing our Father's will and not judging one another and allowing you to be our judge because you're the best one for it. We really do need you in our lives and we thank you for your inspiration of this message, both the hearing and the giving. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. amen. Let us begin by turning to Matthew, the fifth chapter, and let us begin in verse 38. This is entitled, Eye for Eye. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. So this is not the eye for eye, is it? This is a, a different kind of response. We go from the letter of the law to the spiritual response to dealing with people. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your code as well. Be generous to someone who wants to take advantage of you. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them too. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Don't be hard-hearted. Then it goes into verse 43, love for enemies. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That was the old covenant response to how to treat people. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now that's not what we normally would do in a situation like that, is it? We would tend to lash out, become defensive, strike back. And the reason we want to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute you, as it says in verse 45, that you may be the children of your Father in heaven. Now we're all the children of our Father in heaven because Jesus died for our sins, forgave them, and he rose from the dead to give us spirit life by sending us the Holy Spirit. That made us reconciled children of our Father. So we are the children of our Father, so we need to behave that way respond that way. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So we're not above anybody else as far as how God loves us. Now we, the advantage we have in knowing God in Christ is that we have a relationship with God in Christ. The ones who don't know him don't have that relationship. Verse 46, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? You know, if we can do a certain action, then we get a certain prize for doing the action. Well, that's not a relationship. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? You know, birds of a feather flock together. So within that group, we all treat each other with a certain amount of respect, but be perfect. In verse 48, therefore as your heavenly Father is perfect, 
And the reason we can be perfect is that Jesus attributed his righteousness to us in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Therefore, we're the holy children of our Father. That's how we can be perfect, because we're the children of our Father in Christ. So we see that we have a different way of looking at things when Jesus came and he preached the gospel of God's love for us. So let's start over in uh, Matthew, the seventh chapter, about judging. Matthew 7, verse 1. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use it will be measured to you. Now we've come to realize that. If we criticize somebody for looking a certain way, well, we might end up looking a certain way too. So we had to be careful, and we knew this before, of how we look at people and how we would judge them. But Jesus says, don't do it at all. No judging, period. And the reason of that is because the love of God covers it all. As it says in the scripture, the love of God covers a multitude of sins. We cannot do the loving of God toward others by judging them. So in verse 3, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? Uh, Self-inspection would be necessary before making any kind of judgment. So Jesus says, well, just don't. Don't even try. Don't try to minimize your own speck according to what your neighbor has and see who's worse off than the other one. That is a vain thing to do. You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And of course we ought to have self-inspection like that, how we're doing. We ought to give our brother and sister grace and favor and lead the judging to Jesus. Let's go down to 1 John, uh, the fourth chapter. 1 John 4, and beginning in verse 13. 1 John 4, 13. This is how we know that we live in Him, and He in us, referring to, to God or, or to Christ. He has given us of His Spirit. He sent us the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world, John 3:16. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, then God lives in them and they in God. In other words, we can't say that unless we believe. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. We do. And we need to rely on it even more. For God is love, and whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them. And this is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. And we want to have confidence on the day of judgment, don't we? So this is how love is made complete among us. See, by recognizing that we are, when we are believers in Jesus, we have the love of God in our hearts. And we do. So we need to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus every day so that the love of God in our hearts increases because we see how God's love makes us complete. So in this world, we are like Jesus, it says in verse 17. We represent Jesus. Jesus is in our heart. We are his brother or our, his sister in our relationship with our Father and Jesus. There's no fear in love. See, and fear is what makes us judge others because we're trying to compare ourselves among ourselves and that's not a wise thing to do. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. That's why we don't want to judge others because we're thinking punishment upon them. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. 
We love because he first loved us, and whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. See, we either love or we don't love. There's no partial love. If we don't love everybody, we don't love. Because God is love, and God loves everybody. He created us. He loves us as his children, whether we recognize it or not. And that's why God never gives up. And his love never fails. For whoever does not love his their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. No exceptions to that. I don't care if we have problems with them or not. We need to love them, pray for them, ask for them to come to know Jesus more fully and his love so they can become a different person than what they are and irritate us like they might. Just like God is patient with us and loves us whether we're good or bad or indifferent. He just does. That's a real father for you. It's a real brother for us. And the Holy Spirit is a tremendous helper for us to know the truth of Jesus about the love of the Father. So, rather than judging one another, we should be ministering the reconciliation that Jesus has given to us with our Father. Let's notice that over in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14. We know the story here. It says, verse 14, For Christ's love compels us. God's love compels us to do any and everything that we ought to be doing. Now, hopefully we're responding to that compelling. We know when God's compelling us, and sometimes we say no, and we shouldn't. We should say yes right here, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore we all died. We all participated in that. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. He was raised from the dead, and therefore he showed us that we now can have spirit life because he is risen. And so he sent on Pentecost the Holy Spirit to us, and we now have the Holy Spirit in our hearts as well as the Father and Jesus. And we are blessed, and we are whole now. So something happened then at Pentecost. We entered into a different realm. And to those who don't have the Holy Spirit in your hearts today, you can say, Jesus, I believe in you. I want to receive the indwelling Holy Spirit. And I know you're the one who sends it. And I love you because you have given your life for me. And I believe in you because the Father has sent you to save me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In verse 16, that was the new spirit that we received to make us a new creation. We're now a spiritual creation in Christ. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. That eye for an eye thing, that's no longer there. That does not exist in our reality. We have a different point of view, a loving point of view, as God loves us. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. We stop it because it's just taking away from our living life to the large, that abundant life that Jesus gives to us. Verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. So you believe in Jesus, he's in your life, he's in all of our lives, those who believe in Jesus. And everyone needs to believe in Jesus. He's the only hope we have in the whole world. The old is gone, the new is here, and all this is from God, our Father, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. That's why Jesus was sent to us in the overall, overarching way of looking at it. It took the death, it took the resurrection, it took the giving and sending of the Holy Spirit, but this is the reason for it. That's what it says. God sent his son Jesus and and, and it threw him and he gave us, therefore, the reconciliation with our Father. And then our Father says to us, He get, He now gives us, the will of our Father is, He gives us 
the ministry of reconciliation with Jesus. He's the one who started it. He's the one who's given it to us. We're the ones working to conclude the harvest of that wonderful truth before he returns in glory. And the time is ripe. We live in that time when we need to be busy with our Father's business by going to his son Jesus and participating in his ministry of reconciliation. And that is, in verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he's committed to us the message of reconciliation. You and I, brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, we all have this commission from our Father to do, this message. We are therefore Christ ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. The world needs to be reconciled to God. We need to speak it. We need to refer them to the scripture, the holy scripture, the words of life. For God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is a wonderful story, and we're all participants in it. So we have God to thank that we don't judge people. He's the judge. He has the mercy. He has the compassion because he is sent by our Father to save us. So, our Father has given us His only begotten Son, Jesus, to be the judge because He is the Son of Man. Let's notice that over in John, the fifth chapter. John 5. And let us begin in verse 19. John 5 and verse 19. So, Jesus gave them this answer, and it's to answer what they said in verse 18. So let's read that. For this reason they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And that's because he was equal with God. So Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his Father do doing because whatever the father does the son also does and that's the way it is with us and jesus right whatever jesus does that's what we do because it's the father's will for the father loves the son and shows him all he does yes and he will show him even greater works than these so that you will be amazed for just as the father raises the dead and gives them life even so the son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it, and he's pleased to give it to all of us. Every human being on the face of the earth. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. And that's where we are right now, if we believe in Jesus. Very truly, I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. That means that when he was sent to be born of Mary, he became fully human and fully God. He is the Son of Man, and he knows who we are. And he's also our living high priest today, and he knows who we are. And he has compassion and empathy for us. You wouldn't want anybody else to be the judge of you, would you? You want somebody who understands you. Don't we all? Yes, we do. 
So, do not be amazed at this, verse 28, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to life, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. Aren't we thankful Jesus is the judge? By myself I can do nothing, I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Amen and hallelujah. See, we don't have that kind of impartial judgment today in our world. They're all politically driven. What a shameful thing that we would have that and not seek the truth of the matter. But that's where we live and that's what we have to deal with. So let's now go to Revelation, the 20th chapter, and see uh, what leads up to the judgment uh, that Jesus is going to do. And, and it's known as the Great White Throne Judgment in the Scriptures. And Revelation, the 20th chapter, let's go to the beginning of the chapter. Chapter 20 and verse 1. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil, or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss, and locked and sealed it over him, to keep him from deceiving the nations any more, until the thousand years were ended. And after that he must be set free for a short time. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the Word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands, and they came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now, I don't know how that's going to be expressed once he returns in glory, but that's what the Scripture tells us. There's a thousand year period somewhere that God is going to be having us judge things with him over the people who are there. As it says here, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. So this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them but they will be priests of God and of Christ. That's in 2 Peter 2, or maybe 1 Peter 2. It talks about us being a chosen generation because we're a holy generation, and we're a holy generation of priests. And uh, we worship God together as the body of Christ, and we need to do priestly things and worship. So, second death has no power over them, but they will be the priest of God and of Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. Verse 7, when the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and to gather them for battle in numbers they are like the sand of the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city of love, he loves, which is Jerusalem. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who was deceived, had deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the priest or the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. So there's a lot of things, a lot of moving parts here that the final judgment that Christ will rule over, the great white throne judgment. And so we're certainly glad he's able to handle all that the way that God would want him to, our Father, that is. And each person would judge according to what they had done. I'm sure glad we have Jesus as our judge. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. 
and anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. You see, we hope that our judge is impartial. We hope that he is filled with compassion. He has empathy for us. He has love and concern for our well-being. And he gives us every opportunity down through our life to know him. That the scripture is there for us to see who we are in Christ and we can repent and we can grow in his grace and knowledge and his love is just cascading over us all the time through people like us who believe in Jesus and who want to pass that on to others. So let's look at that as we understand Jesus more and more as we look at his word. Hebrews the fourth chapter. Hebrews the fourth chapter. And we want to begin in verse 12. Hebrews 4, verse 12. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, and it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. You see how the word of God does? Helping us to come to see who God is and God's love for us and how we ought to be loving one another. This is going on continually. So broadcasts like this, you know, who emphasize the Word of God and God's love in this book. See, we're benefiting others to see what the Word says about who God is in Christ. So nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything's uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. So right now He's judging the house of Israel, as it says in one place, which is mean, meaning the, the people of God. God is doing this all the time. Ever since he went to the right hand of his father and Pentecost happened 10 days later, this has been happening. This is not just an overnight thing. It's not just a now thing. It's been happening ever since the new, first new Christian church began. And here we are, and we're slacking off. We're becoming almost like Laodicea. We need to get busy again reading the word sharing the Word, living the Word, being the Word, and loving as Jesus loves, and loving as our Father loves us, unconditionally. Because then we go to verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we possess for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, knowing that that's who he is, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So when we think of Jesus on the great white throne, looking at names in the book of life, we must realize what he has done to get as many people as possible in the book of life already. And as he says in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11, that he says, as Paul quoted, that every tongue will confess and every knee will bow to him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, because his righteousness he has attributed to each one of us who believe him. May the love of God give us the understanding we need to go forward and to realize it's not our place to judge because we wouldn't judge impartially. But Jesus does. And he helps us all to be in the book of life before we even get to the judgment. Oh, thanks be to God that he's that kind of a God that he can actually proclaim the love of God will change our hearts. So let us pray that Jesus will be with us this next week, protect us from Satan and his demons, and give us the grace and favor of God to help other people see the love of our Father, the love of Jesus, and the love of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' holy and righteous name we pray, and all together we say, Amen. Amen. Very good, Ben.